I don't know. I don't know if beyond the introduction you, you have something to to say, but I would like to dive immediately into the session with uh, questions to you. Sure. I mean, beyond the introduction, I would just say, first of all, thank you for the invite to be here. This is something to me that's really important um, is this idea of collaboration and um, unity. Um, as we think about what's happening in our world, um, especially on the continent today, um, you know, I, I want to start by acknowledging what's happening in Nigeria specifically with the NSARS movement, the police brutality and kind of this turning point that it feels like we're at as a country. Um, it, it's a good thing, I, I believe, uh, although, you know, it's, it's a tough situation and I'm really prayerful that um, there will be peace and safety maintained, but I'm, I'm hopeful because I'm seeing a rise in youth and youth using their voices to demand change, not only when it comes to police brutality, but specifically to try to drive an agenda around a social evolution to demand better governance, um, which Nigeria has deserved for so long. And I'm hoping that this is a true turning point. But what's exciting to me is the fact that this is really a moment where youth are uniting for a greater cause. And so I think today for me is symbolic of that power of unity. Um, the fact that we are two leaders from the um, Obama Foundation Leaders Program that are uniting for a greater cause. And that's really about trying to equip and empower uh, the next generation. So thank you for having me and um, I'm really glad to be here. Right. Okay, that is um, that is um, nice. Let me let me start simply by um, by asking you what I have what I have watched um, over the years is that what we do tends to become who we are and. Mm -hmm it becomes hard to differentiate between the two. So to kick this session off, um, I would like to ask you, who is Simedeli beyond uh, what you do? Yes, and I think this is an excellent question, a question that we don't ask ourselves enough. I am recently like really being faced with this question because I think you mentioned in my intro um, I worked at a big company for 15 and a half years. And for those 15 and a half years, I was able to kind of hide behind my job title and the, the name of that big company, Nike. And that, that was almost kind of my identity. That's who I was. Um, and since leaving the company about almost two years ago now, I, my last day was in January of 2019. I've now been really faced like never before with the idea of who am I really? Because I no longer had the job description and the fancy job title to, to hide behind. And so the, the honest answer is that I'm still figuring that out. You know, I'm still shaping that every day. I um, learn more about who I am now and who I want to be and who I'm aspiring to be. And so I would say if I had to, uh, define it. The tough part is you ask beyond what you do. And that's a huge question because we typically define ourselves by what we do. Yeah. I've been going through an exercise working with somebody who's been helping me trying to shape some of these things. And recently we worked on an exercise um, where she asked me to, we're trying to define my values. So maybe I'll just share some of those with you because I think when you hear somebody's values, that gives you a sense of who they are. So let me see if I can remember them because we were trying to come up with, I, I wanted to come up with five things. Um, so let's hope I can remember them. <laughs> um, what did I say? Faith and family, that was one. I'm person, I'm a person who cares about, you know, faith, a woman of God and my family. And when I say my family, um, they mean something to me. That's beyond my um, blood family. I extend that to my family of friends, uh, coworkers, teammates. Um, so those relationships are really important. So faith and family is, is number one. 
Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I said, was integrity. Um, honesty and integrity um, were important to me. And that's because to me, if we're not telling the truth, what are we really doing? Um, yeah. Like that's a starting point. Uh, who I am is a person who is honest. And uh, that's just how I roll. So that is something that's important to me. Who I am is also another value um, that I defined was work ethic and achievement. Um, I grew up as a child of immigrants. We came, my parents, you know, I'm Nigerian, but I grew up in the US. So that's why you're hearing a Nigerian ac or an American accent. Um, yeah. But I watched my parents work hard. Uh, I, we moved here when I was six years old. And, you know, oftentimes, like it is with immigrants, you almost have to start over. You know, my dad is a college professor, he's a PhD. My mom, highly educated, master's degree, but having to work a lot of jobs, you know, just because it takes time to adjust and get into a new system. So I've seen her do all kinds of jobs at all kinds of levels. And the, the, the theme and everything that I saw was the work ethic that it takes. Um, and I think that's just something that's been ingrained in me, um, nurtured in me from a young age. So I believe in working hard. I believe in uh, doing the work to get to your goals and um, to that's a necessary um, key to achieving your goals. So work ethic and achievement. Um, I think I also said something about um, bold imagination and achievement or bold imagination and adventure, sorry, adventure. Uh, why not go after something and do it boldly and, and at least picture it, you know, boldly. Imagine, and that, that doesn't cost you anything. I think sometimes it's so easy to um, think the other extreme. We are so, it's, it's funny to me how the mind works. Um, naturally, it, it takes us to the negative and that doesn't take us a lot of effort to think of the worst case. But oftentimes we have to put some intentionality um, in thinking of the best case. And that takes bold imagination and adventure. I love a good adventure. So the thing that excites me most, I just mentioned I'm about to go to Austria and Germany. Yes, I'll do some training, but I'm really excited because I've never been to Austria. So that's a new country. I love traveling. I love adventure. Um, maybe that's why I end up doing a sport like skeleton. But um, I think in life, you know, if you can have some adventure in your life, then you're, you're in a good space. I don't know if that's all five of them, but I think uh, hopefully that gives you an idea of who I am, not what I do. Some of the things that are important to me. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, um, who you are is, uh, is, is, is sorry, up. yeah, I remembered, I've, I looked at my notes, okay, um, kindness and generosity, okay, that's what I strive to be, I want to be kind, um, and I want to be generous, do I mm. always hit the mark on that, no, but <laughs> at least that's, that's what I want to be, a kind person, that's who I am, and a generous person. Um, right. So I think that's it. Sorry to interrupt you, go ahead. Oh no, that's, uh, that's totally fine. I was saying a life of, a, a life, you know, of values. So I like that. Um, what inspired you to, to be on this, on this path that you are on right now? Where did the inspiration come from? Yes, that's a good question, especially because it's such a unique sport. And uh, maybe I can provide some context to everybody that's on the call on what the sport is, because it's not a commonly known sport. So it's called skeleton. And um, the reason I, I heard that it's called skeleton is because the early sleds that people used to use in the sport looked like skeletons, apparently. But it's not a great name because nobody ever knows what it is. Um, but it's a sport that is a sport uh, that uh, is a winter Olympic sport. 
and you are basically on something that looks like a tray that um, is no longer than uh, about a, the size of a suitcase, a large suitcase. And you lie down on this tray and this tray kind of has ice skates on the bottom of it so that you can glide on ice. And um, you lay down on your tummy on this tea tray and you put your arms by your side and then you go head first, face down, down a giant ice track. So just imagine a huge mountain that has a track on the side of it that allows you to go down. So I tell people to also picture like a, a giant frozen water slide. That's, that's, yeah, that's what we go down. And you're going actually at speeds that are up to 120 kilometers an hour. So very fast speeds and you're going head first. There's no brakes on this braking mechanism. There's no safety belt. And your job is to navigate these twists and turns as quickly as you can and get to the finish line as fast as you can. So that's the sport in a nutshell. It's not a sport that is well known to me or um, certainly not in Nigeria. In fact, Nigeria, as you might know, does not have a winter season. Uh, Nigeria doesn't have snow or ice. And I was part of the group that went to the Winter Olympics and represented Nigeria for the very first time. So yeah. that exact opportunity was what inspired me to, to be part of the sport. Um, I actually grew up playing a number of sports, track and field being the main one. Um, and that was my original dream that I, I wanted to pursue uh, going to the Olympics in. That didn't work out and I had moved on with my life and started focusing on more of my career. But about 10 years after I, I didn't make my original dream, which was the Summer Olympics, I, I was introduced to the sport of skeleton and introduced so more to the opportunity uh, to make history by becoming the first African and black woman to compete in the sport at the Olympics. That I wanna stress is an important thing. So I learned about the sport, but the bigger thing was the opportunity um, to perhaps do something that hadn't been done before. And that was what the inspiration point really was, was not necessarily about the sport itself. It was about the bigger mission and purpose that this represented. For me, it was like, yes, I can make history, but it was more symbolic of an opportunity to help shape the narrative of the continent of Africa. Um, I don't know where different people are on this Zoom joining in, but I felt at the time I was living in Johannesburg when this whole journey started. And at that time I'd been living in Joburg for about four years. Um, and I mentioned earlier that I grew up in the US. So when I got the opportunity to live in Joburg as an adult and really start experiencing the continent in a new way, I traveled to many different countries and just started seeing, you know, just the true reflection of what the continent of Africa in my mind stands for. It's a great place. It's a place of excellence, a place of innovation, a place where people are vibrant a place of um, resilience. This to me was a stark juxtaposition uh, of what maybe sometimes is portrayed in the media. The stories of death, disease, destruction. That's yeah. the narrative that we use, we're used to seeing. And so as I was living and experiencing Joburg and seeing the reality, I felt that there was just a huge gap. And I was very passionate about what I could do in my own personal capacity to help to shape the narrative in a positive way, the narrative of Africa, to tell the great stories that exist on the continent. And I thought that my talent and my capability uh, was in the area of sports. And so I wanted to use that gift um, to then um, really as a vehicle to drive that bigger mission so that's what got me into the sport. So recognizing that opportunity. And then the second part is taking action on it because you can, opportunities exist all around us. I'm sure 
each of you on this call in your countries, wherever you are, there's opportunities all around. The question right. is, what are you gonna do about it? And taking action is the second uh, very important part of that process um, as we're talking about you know, leadership um, and the next generation and, and driving change. Wow, that is interesting. I hope um, I hope the the participants are listening closely, and they will also have uh, a chance to ask questions. Yeah, I really like I really like what you have just said. Um, seeing something that is missing, and, uh, take, to take action. You know, it is it is just ties in with the, with the theme of this webinar series, uh, leading and taking action in uncertain times. Mm -hmm. So that is really interesting. So I would like to to go to the next question. Um, I am already writing a lot of things. I'm learning a lot of things. I'm being inspired. What was it like, that journey? Share with us that journey from then on when you decided to, 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 to take action and say, you know, I'm going for this. I'm going to participate in the Winter Olympics. Um, mm. in, in, they were in North Korea, South Korea. South Korea. South Korea. So you, you, are, you are a young woman from Nigeria. Now you are in, a, you were in Canada by that time? Yes, yeah, so I grew up in Canada and the US. And, but when this journey started, I was living and working in Johannesburg. Right, so you were in Johannesburg. Yeah. And this idea to participate in the Winter Olympics comes to your mind. You look yeah. around. There is no, there is really nothing to use, but you start to put pieces together. So, so tell us, take us through that journey until you arrived in South Korea and you saw yourself skating. <laughs> I saw myself on a tea tray headed down a track at, at crazy high speeds. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the journey really started when, um, uh, I started hearing about this, uh, the Nigerian women's bobsled team. So those were my teammates who ultimately went to the Olympics with alongside me as well. And they had been kind of at it um, and working towards this goal of uh, becoming the first African team, uh, team from any country in Africa to get to the Olympic games in bobsled. And so somebody had actually shared a link with me of this YouTube video that had gone viral um, of my teammates who, I don't know if anybody has seen this video, but they were in uh, uniforms that said Nigeria, green and white, and they were dancing and somehow the video had gone viral. And so one of my coworkers shared that video and said, oh, um, you know, I thought this was interesting. I know you're Nigerian and you might find this interesting. And I thought it was cool um, but I, I started doing some research and I came to find out exactly who these women were and what they were trying to do. And it caught my attention for two reasons. Um, like I said, one, I thought it was really cool that this was an opportunity to, in my mind, um, do something positive for the continent of Africa by making history. Um, and then the, the other part of this was that for me, it was still a way that could revive an old dream. So I mentioned that I started out as a um, track and field athlete and that was what I originally wanted to make the Olympics in. And I didn't make it. And so I had kind of put that dream to rest. But when I saw this, I thought, well, that dream kind of came alive in me again. And I thought maybe this is my shot at being an Olympian. So I think that's that was a very important part of the journey is being willing to reimagine perhaps um, an old dream. So uh, taking it from summer to winter 
and being open to the possibility that this could come around in a different way for me. And so once I was open to that idea, I started doing my research. And I think this is actually the advantage that this generation has, um, is the ability to have all of these tools at their fingertips. Um, so maybe if this was 20 years ago, I might've had a more difficult time um, trying to enter a world like this. Um, but in this day and age, I was able to Google, research, everything that I could do to learn about what, what is this sport and what, what am I trying to do? So I started researching and through the power of Instagram, I was able to track down those women and started kind of communicating with them and then finally saw a post that they shared about inviting more people to try out for the team. And so I went to that tryout on a whim and not knowing much about the sport, um, but just deciding, you know, I have nothing to lose. And I think um, looking back, that's another, I think, important part of the process. Um, that mindset that, you know, I have nothing to lose. There are moments where you do have things to lose, but I think the more we can just embrace this idea that, you know, I have more to gain than I have to lose and just be open-minded as you um, explore new paths, I think um, is something that can take you far. So uh, I went to the tryout and uh, ended up doing well and uh, was invited to a team camp. And at that team camp is when um, I realized that it wasn't gonna work out for bobsled because that team was already in place. And that's when I started um, looking into skeleton. And once I decided, okay, I'm gonna do skeleton and the way I was able to make a decision as to is skeleton gonna work or not, I asked myself two questions. Why not you and why not now? So for me, um, I knew that somebody at some point in time was going to have to make history. Yeah, to, 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 somebody was going to do this at some point. So I didn't have any good reasons why that person couldn't be me and why it couldn't be now. And so I think this is similar, um, Enoch, to what we say, you know, as uh, Obama Foundation leaders, when we say, we are the ones, right? right? So you are the ones that we're waiting for. You can't wait for other people to do it. It can be you. So why not you and why not now? And that's the same approach I took to this. I was like, somebody's going to have to do this. So it has to be me. So I, I went on and from that point, I had about a hundred days before the Olympics. So in that process of that hundred days, I had to really um, devote myself to trying to learn this new sport. I spent time you know, in the US and Canada at the different locations and training facilities, just trying to figure out the sport. Um, luckily, I had a coach that was able to also help me, um, but yeah, through a very steep learning curve, um, uh, lots of ups and downs along the way, I was able to qualify and eventually get to the Olympics in that short period of time. So that was the process in a, in a high level nutshell. This is, this is great. I, I really like um how you say that you didn't have even the knowledge about the sport but you decided to to explore that you know um and having in mind that you know someone would make history around in this area and you decided to make it be you isn't isn't that great <laughs> <laughs> Well, somebody has to do it. Why not you, you know? <laughs> uh, what, um, I understand, you, what, I, probably you have already touched on it. I was going, the, the question about the kind of challenges you, you, uh, you faced mm -hmm. and you have already touched, you know, lack of knowledge about the game. You were not used, you know, to the game. Um, <laughs> You have probably also, you know, yeah, like not even knowing, having the relationship with the other group for women, 
but but I would I would still pose it Be, uh, beyond those two. Which other really challenges stood out? Which really challenges stood out? Okay, so two come to mind. So uh, when I first started the sport, um, I knew I didn't have a lot of time. You know, a hundred days is not a long time, especially in a sport like this. When it takes typically it takes years and years to master this the sport and a lot of practice. So I was trying to do something that on average, I'm told, takes about eight years. I was trying to compress that into 100 days. So um, I had to really be innovative in my thinking and my approach to the sport and how I was going to try to fast track my learning and accelerate it to the point where I could position myself to qualify for the games. And so the way that I went about this was um, really trying to challenge myself to start at the tracks that were the most difficult. So the way that most people approach the sport is they start with the easiest tracks first, and then they work their way to the most difficult tracks. But because I knew I had a short time, I did the opposite. I started at the most dangerous and fastest track in the world, I started there first. And so on day three of ever doing the sport, um, that's where I was on the, the most difficult track. And um, I actually had a very tough moment at this track where I made some mistakes on a run and ended up going feet first down this track. And feet first is a very scary place to be because uh, when you're going feet first, you can't see where you're going. And at such high speeds, like I said, 120 at that track, 140 kilometers an hour is very, very scary. So I was literally praying that I would survive this particular run. And uh, luckily the sled came to a stop. I survived, I was okay. And I was able to go and take many more runs that were successful. But I'm sharing this because this was a moment where I was going the wrong direction. And that's literal and figuratively. It looked like I was going the wrong direction. But I think in those moments where we make mistakes and we have um, failures, those are the moments that really propel us forward. Because uh, what I've learned in that moment going feet first is what not to do. <laughs> I learned that, you know, this is what got me in that situation and this is what I will need to do to make sure that I'm never in that situation again. And so it was a moment where I had to be bold even in the face of fear and know that, you know, like I've failed in a lot of ways by making this major mistake but it actually did exactly what I thought it would do, which was ultimately it accelerated my learning. And um, so I wanna challenge everyone on this call to be willing to disrupt the norms, to be willing to build um, plans and be innovative in your thinking and how you want to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish uh, because you will reach some some challenges along the way um, where you feel like you're going in the yeah, yeah. direction and feet first, like I was in that moment. Um, but know that that's part of the process. It's a natural part of the learning process and the natural part of your journey to success, those failures. So embrace those just in the same way as you embrace the successes. Um, but it starts with, first of all, stepping back and thinking about making your plans as bold as you can make them, make them innovative, um, disrupt the norms with them because you'll have those opportunities where you fail and you fail fast perhaps and you learn and then you continue to propel yourself forward. The other challenge I would say is when I did finally reach the Olympic games, for some reason is, is, uh, it's at that time that it dawned on me that I was way less experienced than the people that I was competing against. And I show up at the games with just a few months under my belt. And these women were, they're professionals, right? They've been doing this sport since some of them, since, you know, teenagers or 10 years old in Nigeria yeah. that we don't do that. Nobody knows this sport, right? Um, and so they had a big advantage 
on me. And I started allowing that to impact my confidence and really getting very nervous and uh, not being sure of myself. Um, and so this was a major challenge that I had to work through. This is the Olympics, it's the big time. It's not the time to now come and like, you know, <laughs> not uh, be able to perform at my best. And so um, I was finally able to work through this by really repositioning things for myself and, um, and focusing on what I am good at. Um, and so at the games, um, I realized that, you know, I don't have the same level of experience that the other women do, but I do have um, speed. And that's something that I had been working on my whole life as a track and field athlete. So I focused on my ability to, to be fast. And uh, I pressed into that strength and allowed it to be my competitive advantage. So even in those moments of doubts that you might have, um, along the way, there will be those moments, especially in the biggest spaces, in the biggest stages, when it's time to shine and when it matters most, that's oftentimes when you have those fears, doubts, and challenges that creep in, but you, it's, it's your job to overcome that by repositioning it, and one way that I learned to do that is pressing into my strengths and allowing those strengths to be my competitive advantage in those moments that were tough. Hmm. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad. I, I hope, um, you know, this is making sense uh, because what I hope is that, you know, um, maybe pe some people on here might be interested in sport, but this is to me bigger than sport. Um, these right. are lessons in leadership, right? This is, this is uh, a path that this is a story about you know making a path for yourself um, and, and creating your own lane, um, whether you're doing that through sport or not. So I'm, I'm trying to really extract the lessons that um, for me are applicable to anybody in anything that you're doing. Actually, on this call, there is a, it is quite interesting. They, you, if you can, uh, there is a, a lady here called uh, Lydia. She's <laughs> she has stepped out to to compete uh, in active politics. Oh, awesome. And she wants to join uh, uh, parliament, the Ugandan parliament next year. Oh, so nice. I think she's, she must be benefiting a lot from your conversation, from your talk. Nice, nice. Hi, Lydia. <laughs> and everyone else. Yeah. So yeah, so those are some of the challenges, uh, those two specifically, being turned in the wrong direction and then getting to the biggest competition of my life and, and feeling unsure of myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you would speak to your young self, mm -hmm. if you would speak to your young self, what would you say to her right now? Like now, this is 2020, mm -hmm. go back to your young self, maybe at, you know, seven, 10 years, what would you say to her? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, it, I would say to her, um, it will be okay. Everything will be okay. And the reason I would say that to her is because I think there'll, there will be times now knowing that there are times in hindsight, it's easy to see this, where it seems like, you know, things aren't going well or, or you wonder why are you going through such and such or why is life unfolding this way? So a moment like that, um, for example, was when I didn't make that original uh, dream of mine to become a summer Olympian. That was a very painful experience in my life, uh, uh, s filled with such disappointment to know that I worked so hard at that goal for so many years and just didn't make it. And um, in that moment, if I knew then what I know now, I would say everything is gonna be okay. That right. sometimes, you know, you are, you know, you're still, you're always a work in progress. So you may not get that immediate result, but it's, it's taking you somewhere 
I would, I think I would tell myself to just accept and embrace all parts of the journey and to know that the disappointment sometimes can also lead to um, the success. So um, everything will be all right, is what I would tell myself and to just have peace with that and um, have faith in that, knowing that um, it's all part of the journey. Very nice. Um, maybe I will come, I will come back, but I would like to, to open up the session to everyone here. Please, if you have a question to our speaker, feel free to raise your hand, to drop your question uh, in the chat. Um, so as we wait for questions and uh, an engagement from the audience, I would like to ask you another, another simple, simple question. Uh, I don't know if it is simple. Um, something, what, what is the best advice you have ever received in, in your life and wh who was it from? Um, I probably had a lot of really good advice at different points in life. Um, so I'll preface it, I'll preface that just because I'm like the best, that's, that's a lot of pressure on, on, <laughs> on the advice, but I'll give you one example, one piece of advice that stuck with me over the years. And that was when I was working at Nike and I was in a place in my career where I was trying to figure out what, what I wanted to do and what was next. Nike is a huge company, right? Global company. It's a very recognizable, well-known brand. And it's a great place to be for so many reasons. And I think at that point, I was probably maybe around nine, 10, 10 years into my career. Right. And just feeling like, you know, where am I going to go next in this company? And um, the, the person that gave me this advice was a former VP at Nike. And as I was sharing with him kind of my confusing kind of lost direction, um, his advice to me was to not get lost in Nike's dream but to make sure that I am leveraging Nike to propel my own dreams. And that really stuck with me because I think this happens so much to, to people where you get in a place, in a company, in an organization, and you just get swallowed by that organization's agenda. So Nike is a beautiful place. Like I said, I love it. I'm, I'm actually still a Nike athlete today, representing the brand, wearing the brand in that capacity. Right. And so, um, you know, and it started with one person's dream. If you know the Nike story, um, this guy named Phil Knight, he started the company in the back of his truck selling shoes and all of this. And he built this gigantic multi-billion dollar dream. And now I'm an employee working every day on his dream. And which is awesome. But what that person's advice to me was, is don't allow that to be the end all and be all. That I still within that need to have my own dreams and maybe perhaps see how Nike can propel those dreams. So once I kind of started thinking that way, then I thought, what are the experiences that I want? And how can I make sure that I get those here at Nike? So this led me to then think about, you know what? I've always wanted to be part of um, building the Nike business in on the continent of Africa. Right. I want to work there. I want to live and work there. That's one of my dreams. And so after a lot of networking and beating down doors, I finally was able to um, have a job opportunity in Johannesburg and that's what took me there. But it was the idea of trying to really understand my own dreams and thinking about how Nike can be a vehicle to my dreams rather than me being swallowed up by Nike's dream and only working on Nike, Nike's dream. I hope that makes sense, but Wherever you are, I think you have to be aware of that and always keep your own 
dream present and top of mind and not allow yourself to be swallowed up in somebody else's. Amazing, amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will pick, I will pick this question here from, uh, from Javis. What would, would, would you say that if you, your parents stayed in Nigeria, you would have hit some milestones you talked about today? Yeah, that is a very good question. And I have thought about that over the years. What would my life have been like? Um, and would it have been the same? Uh, I, think, I think so in some ways, but I think the reality of you know, uh, the Nigerian context is, is very different. Um, and perhaps the, the things that I might have had, have had access to may have been different. But I think the things that would have been the same, and my parents have been like from day one, Nigerians are <laughs> education, education, education. So that would have been constant. I would have still had made sure I had education. What I seen that might have been different is um, that I would not maybe have had access to organized sports. And for me, that's something that I hope to contribute to improving one day um, across Africa, not just in Nigeria. I don't think that there's enough um, access to organized sports at a youth level, at a grassroots level, and for people to have that opportunity for development, um, you know, as they grow as athletes. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think, but, you know, Africa, <laughs> has some of the best athletes in the world. And I think, you know, when you think about whether you're talking about runners or uh, football players, we find a way to do it. So I actually think that I might've been even better <laughs> because I wouldn't have been in a system that was so structured and cushioned and comfortable. Um, I would have really had to create, like many of us do on the continent, you have to now be innovative and creative about how you go after the same thing. And so I think I would have been a lot more determined and had to have a lot more grit and, and resilience to, to accomplish the same thing. So I would have reached probably the same milestones, but I would have had to do it in a different way, in a different context. Right. Yeah. I, I, like, I like how you put it. Mm -hmm. Um, so Becca wants to ask the, the next question. Becca, feel free to, to go ahead. Sure, I apologize for some background noise here in Addis. Um, I guess I'm curious how, as an athlete in a, a sport, which is an individual sport, um, mm -hmm. but also you do a lot of um, incredible, uh, I guess, an individual work. As leaders, sometimes I think we feel a little bit of like a burden on us, but at the same time know that there is such a huge value of being in a team and working together. And I feel especially at this time with a lot of the challenges we're facing surrounding the coronavirus, um, just really understanding the importance of what it means to rely on other people and to have their support and um, mobilizing together for change in whatever way that means to each of us. And so I guess to, to make it into a question, um, what has it meant for you in, um, you know, pursuing your, your, your dream and your goals as an individual but at the same time, um, kind of building up uh, like a team around you that has perhaps supported you or um, kind of led you to, to where you are? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, teams are definitely important. Um, it's, it's difficult to get to wherever you want to go without the support of a, of a team. Um, I was going to attempt to share the, an African proverb that talks about that. And I've, of course, I don't want to botch the proverb, but <laughs> probably people on this call have, have heard it in some context or another where it basically says that we can accomplish more together. We can go further together. And of course we know that there's things like Ubuntu and things like that that talk about kind of the power of, you know, 
of uh, the unity and, and working together to, to do things. So I definitely believe in that, but my journey has not always unfolded like that so neatly. So I would say um, on my journey to the Olympics, it was quite lonely in a lot of ways. Um, and I think as leaders, it's important to recognize and embrace that that is all part of leadership. There's a loneliness in leadership. Um, why it was lonely for me, um, especially at the beginning, was that uh, not many people understood what I was trying to do. Um, they didn't quite get it. It seemed crazy. And um, I had to make a more kind of intentional effort to actually protect um, the dream that I had and not allow it to be um, kind of uh, infiltrated by what other people thought, <laughs> you know, uh, because a lot of times when you have a bold vision or uh, you want to do something that hasn't been done before, it takes a lot of courage and guts and um, and so when you're in that early phase, you know, of really trying to take the steps to start building the foundation of that, you're vulnerable. And the last thing that I feel that you need is infiltrators coming in. Some people call them haters, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> Distractions are what they are. And sometimes in the very early stages of what you're trying to do, I feel that it, it's in your best interest to perhaps protect it and not allow too many outside opinions to you know, discourage you. And so, but within that, it can be lonely, right? Because you may not have that support that you need. So it's a balance and there's no right or wrong way. Um, but I started eventually identifying the people that had a shared vision. And this is important because when you do build a team and when you have a team, it's important to make sure you have the right team. And so as I started kind of discovering people that saw what I saw, believed what I believed and, and thought that I could do it, these are not yes people only. So I'm not suggesting that you don't have people on your side that challenge you and sometimes ask you to consider, you know, looking at something in a different way, but fundamentally they share your vision and your values. I think that's important. Um, but the first half of my journey was, um, was a little bit lonely because I didn't have as many people who were really in my corner. Um, but as I got closer to the Olympic games and I think as people actually started seeing that actually this might actually happen, <laughs> um, I, I was finding more people that were, you know, starting to see it. And so, um, you know, just, just know that as leaders, sometimes you might have to go out on a limb, be by yourself in kind of creating this vision initially. Um, but at the right time, I think getting the right people on board is really important and, and making sure that you have that right support around you. Um, as I train for the next Olympic Games in 2022, that's something that I've, I've been working hard at is building that support system and that infrastructure um, from early on this time around, because I have a little bit more time. So um, this summer, especially, I've been really identifying those people. So now I work with um, a, a few different coaches that are helping me with uh, different aspects of my sport, um, from the technical elements of it um, and into just the planning element and helping me really have the vision that I need to get to my goals from a performance standpoint. I also have a sports psychologist on my team now. This is something I hadn't had before to make sure that as I'm training my body, my mind is also being uh, as strong as it can be. Um, I have a nutritionist now. Okay, what goes into the body? <laughs> so you can do all the training you want, but if you're not fueling it correctly, then you know it's, it's not uh, this, as, as good as it can be. Um, I have people who are not, you know, full time on the team, but are maybe consultants. So um, uh, maybe about a month ago now, I spoke to a sleep cons consultant. So I, there's people that I'm tapping into in different points of time that are helping me. Now, this is just uh, for me as an Olympic athlete. Um, when I look at, you know, my career and the things that I want to do outside of sport, I'm also tapping into different people, mentors that. Um, know about um, different fields that I'm trying to explore. 
um, that are also part of my team um, and also help me. Um, so, and then the other part that I love too is connecting with young people. I have um, a few different um, young women I'm mentoring. They're part of my team. They think that they're coming to me for advice, but when I talk to them, they're also giving me perspective. Um, so I've kind of built this village of people um, that are helping me inside and outside of sport at this point in time. So I hope that answers the question in terms of the importance of team, but also recognizing that as leaders, um, there will be times where we're forging the path um, and it may feel lonely and isolating in a way and just being prepared for that, um, that could be part of the journey as well. Interesting. I even, I even like how balanced your, your team creation is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all need a team, right? And I, I, I think for me, like this was very evident when I did leave the corporate world. Um, that was one of the biggest transitions um, about that. It was the fact that, you know, you almost take it for granted when I was working in my corporate job you're part of a team. Every day you go to work, you see people, whether you like them or not, actually. Um, they're part of your world. You're constantly embedded in a team. But when I left the corporate world, um, I really had to adjust to this idea that I'm now on my own, working by myself, trying to build a future, but without a team. And that was a big adjustment. And so I've been really trying to now proactively figure out what my team looks like, what my org chart looks like, what my coworkers look like. And so I've, I've been forced to be proactive about it, but um, you don't have to wait until you leave a corporate job to do that. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is, uh, that is interesting. So Fiona here, has uh, three questions. Mm -hmm. She asks, what motivates you to move forward? That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I am sure you undergo some kind of pressure. How do you handle it? Mm -hmm. And then number three, how do you feel about your achievements so far? Yes, okay, all great questions. Uh, so what motivates me to move forward? Um, particularly as an athlete, I'll say the fact that there's still more work to be done. I made history at the Olympics and that was exciting uh, to make history. But this time when I go back, I wanna do more than just make history um, and more than just being, oh, there's an African woman competing. Well, that's great. Well, what did that African woman do? Um, mm -hmm. So I know that I still have a lot of untapped potential within this sport. And um, I know that this time around, I have more than 100 days. And I know that because I've built the right team and I've put in the work, I'm excited to see what I can do in terms of getting back to the games and making a bigger impact from my performance. And so that's what's motivating me going forward is to kind of cement the idea of, um, the African narrative in the winter sports context. We don't only just show up, we are, we show up and we compete, you know, and right. so that that's exciting. That's motivating me um, on the track and on the field of play. Off the field of play, I'm motivated by just seeing what's possible. I'm in a phase now where I'm exploring my potential. I'm no longer confined by a job description or uh, what somebody says I should do. Now I get to become whoever I wanna be. So I am motivated to see what that could be. <laughs> so I am continuing to shape it every day and I'm motivated by also making impact. Um, and I am coming fresh off of reading Becoming, which is Michelle Obama's uh, book. Um, Yay, I read her book and several other memoirs. But anyway, what's, what stuck out in her book to me was, I, and I, I guess I knew this before, but maybe I just heard it in a different way through her memoir was, 
um, just knowing that her and President Obama were really driven by the impact they could make, how they could change the world in a way that matched what they, the potential that they saw in people, in improving people's lives, knowing that change is something um, that's slow to happen sometimes, but really willing to just take action to help make progress in some kind of way, even if they don't reach the ultimate goal and maybe you know changing healthcare in the way that they see, but perhaps the mark that they've left would have moved it forward in some way. So her, her book really caused me to reflect on what kind of impact am I making in this world? Um, and again, I don't have the answer to that, <laughs> but um, that's something that motivates me as I go forward is answering that question. What kind of impact am I making? Um, so second question, um, undergoing some kind of pressure and how I handle it, definitely. Pressure is part of life. It's part of sport. It's part of everything you're gonna do. And yeah. uh, so I shared earlier about getting to the Olympics and feeling a lack of confidence because I didn't have that um, experience like the other women and also feeling pressure, right? The Olympic games is a big deal. Millions of people are watching you. And there was actually, um, after my first day of competing at the Olympics, uh, there was a uh, Nigerian newspaper that put my picture on the fr front page of the newspaper and had a huge headline that said, Simidele disappoints. And I started seeing this pop up on social media everywhere and it was being shared. And luckily people were on my side for that. And they were like, that's horrible. The paper should have never said that. But that's yeah. pressure, right? When a country, the whole country is, like this is the first time they're sending a team to the Olympics and they want you to do well. They don't even know what the sport is, but they just want you to represent the country. Um, wow. And um, so, but how I handle pressure is going back to the idea of focusing my mind on the things that I know that I'm good at. So rather than uh, focusing on, you know, the things that um, are, can manifest as doubts or fears, I try to shift my focus. And so this is something, like I said, I have a sports psychologist on the team and uh, we've been talking about that um, and practicing that. So in those moments that you feel pressure, um, she encourages me to think about how I can in that moment shift to the thoughts that are going to help me move toward my goal. So the first step is to recognize that, okay, yes, I feel under pressure, I'm nervous, that's okay. And recognize that that's part of this process. Everyone's, you know, is anxious at, at certain points, no problem with that. Once you have acknowledged that, then you recognize the types of thoughts that you're having. Are, there, are they thoughts that are moving you towards your goal or are they thoughts that are moving you away from your goal? So some people could classify that as positive, negative, I don't know. However you wanna, I guess, classify those thoughts, but they're either one of two things. They're either moving you closer to where you're trying to go or pulling you further. So if I'm spending my time thinking about how, you know, I'm, you know, I have less experience than everyone else and I don't look like anyone else and I'm, you know, whatever, that's not helping. But if I'm spending my time thinking about, you know, I'm one of the fastest athletes here and uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm ready to be here. Those are thoughts that are moving me closer. So practicing the idea that in the moment you can train your mind to shift your focus in that direction helps. And then the third thing that helps, I think with pressure is preparation. Um, there always be pressure, but I feel like I don't feel the pressure as much when I feel the most prepared. Uh, for me, preparation just, um, just removes that pressure because at that point you've done everything that you can do. So what is there to be pressured on? The outcome yeah. will just be the outcome. And I guess that ultimately is, you know, what I, I know is, is conducive of the best results as well as when you let go of the outcome, when you've prepared as best as you can, 
and you know that you're ready, you've done all the training, you've eaten the right foods, you studied, you've done what you need to do, you come to that board meeting prepared, you go to that legislation meeting prepared, and now you let go of the outcome and you're just there to do what you know you can do. That's how I think is a, is a great way to handle pressure. And then how do you feel about your achievements so far? Well, I mean, I, I hope they're okay. <laughs> I, I feel proud of the being an Olympian. Not many people have accomplished that. And I, I'm proud to say that I have. Um, I think there's still more to be done. There's not a finish line on this. Um, I think uh, I continue to learn and grow every day. Um, and so I'm not gonna rest on my laurels, but I can, uh, I have some things that I can be proud about. Mm. Very nice. Um, that's, uh, that's very interesting. I think we have reached a time when we need to, to wrap up. Uh, I, even though I feel like we need to go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> so I will tie these two. In, um, uh, I would like you to touch on three things you would say to a young person in Africa who is struggling, who feels like they can't like achieve their goals. Um, so I would like you to touch briefly on the three things you would say to such a young person. Then you can also make your final remarks as we wrap up. Okay, I feel like three things is, is, is it's tough because there's a lot to say. And I hope that some of the things that I said along the way will, um, will uh, ring true to anybody on this call and beyond. But I, I think I'll, I'll pick three things from some of the things that I've already said. Um, one is why not you and why not now? So I think that's important because I think that, especially coming from uh, the continent of Africa, one of the things that I personally feel um, that I see that happens is that people will almost discredit you. You're, maybe you feel like you're up against the odds and it can't be you, but the good news is it can be you um, and it can be now. So I think just embracing the idea that it's possible, you know, you are the one, you can be that one person um, and deciding that that's a choice you can make. Nobody, can stop you from making that choice um, and, and choosing to take action. So why not you and why not now is the first thing I would say. The second thing that I would say is, um, I think that uh, you maybe, whether you recognize it or not, um, based on the probably maybe the environment and the the, this is the beauty of Africa that I think inherently you have a lot of um, advantages in terms of being innovative, creative. It's the way of life, <laughs> you know, it's how we are, you know, we, we have uh, lots of grit and resilience. Don't take those skill sets for granted. Use everything around you, use everything about you um, to take whatever you want to do and put your own personal imprint on it. Leadership is not always about following, you know, um, somebody's footsteps or it's not always about creating something completely new either. Sometimes it is enough to just uh, build on something and put your own spin on it. But whatever it is, is I think do it from a place of um, purpose um, and authenticity. So uh, find your strengths and really exploit those. Um, everything about you is going to help you get to where you need to get to. Mm. Um, and I would say that, um, what is the last thing? Um, hmm. Yeah, just uh, be willing to take those risks. Mm. Com comfort is, is going to keep you exactly where you are. Uh, right. What risk will you be willing to take? And it will involve 
risk. So I hope that you are comfortable with the uncomfortable and risks will come in different forms, sometimes smaller, sometimes bigger, but it's part of what you're gonna have to do to, to get to where you wanna go to. So get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Hmm. Ah, I think, I think uh, we are not going to, to go beyond that. Uh, that is really good, being comfortable with the uncomfortable. Good, amazing. Um, so I would like to, to invite you to make your final remarks. Okay, well, my final remarks are that um, we need you. Africa needs you, the world needs you to um, uh, leave your mark, to make your impact. Um, some might say that it's not enough, but I think it's always enough when you're using your gifts and talents um, in a way that will uh, transform the world in a positive way. Um, I'm saying that because I think that what I've done to me is, is maybe not, it's not like uh, I didn't do anything involving climate change or anything. I'm not like solving major world problems, but I am utilizing my skill set, my talent as an athlete, um, as a person of influence to try to um, transform the world in a way that <clears throat> I'd like to see it transformed. So it's not always about, it doesn't have to be anything that is, you know, just this crazy thing. Don't discredit what you can do. <clears throat> it's about really using your own uh, position, your own power, your own privilege, and your own platform, whatever that looks like, um, in a way that's gonna just move things forward. So that is my encouragement to you is to start where you are um, and know that where you are within that space, you can already do something. And so it's up to you to think about what that could be. And I'd like to personally challenge you to think about what your next 100 days looks like between now and February 1st, that's the next 100 days. Yeah. How, how can you create change? What impact can you make in that time? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe set yourself a goal, identify something you'd like to accomplish and, and think about three steps that you can take to move closer to those goals, to that goal in the next 100 days. So uh, I hope that um, as my, maybe my story has highlighted, you can get a lot done in a hundred days. So I'm excited to see where you are next February, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you with that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, thank you very much, Smideli, for, for your time. Um, no worries. To be, to be honest, when I reached out to you, I never thought you would accept uh, to avail your time. I, 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 as I said in the beginning, I had seen that you had started uh, a training and getting ready. But when you accepted to be present, that, is, that, was, really, that was really amazing. So we have had people register from countries of Rwanda, uh, the Kingdom of Swaziland, uh, South Africa, uh, Morocco, Somalia. And I'm very, very grateful for everyone who managed to turn up today. It is, we are very, very grateful. We would like to have you on the next session uh, until the end of the year. Oh, no, this has been great. And um, I didn't uh, circle back on this in my closing remarks, but uh, this is uh, the power of unity again and collaboration. So I want to also just encourage you to live in that spirit because what it will take to do the things that we need to do is collaboration. When you do find those like-minded people who share your vision and your passion, connect with them and see how together you can lift each other up and move even further um, together. And that's exactly what Enoch and I are doing today as leaders coming together um, with a shared vision of really 
equipping leaders to be the great leaders that they can be. So it's in that spirit. And I, I encourage you to continue that spirit as well. Amazing. Yeah, so I'm just leaving um, on the chat there ways in which we can connect. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on social media at Simi Slays. Come find me, chat, let's stay connected. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to all the great things that uh, I'm gonna see you do in future. <laughs> yeah, so I can say that uh, we have wrapped up our session. Um, yeah. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great time. Thank you. Have a good one and have a great weekend. Take care. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. And Thank you. <laughs>